The views and opinions expressed on this public access programming do not necessarily represent those of the HUA Media family of radio stations. It's time for Sunday morning public access programming on this HUA Media radio station. Good Sunday morning to you. It's time for our public access programming here on HUA Media's five Oahu radio stations. I'm Johnny Merrill. We're here at 101.1 FM, 101.5 FM, 97.1 FM. 107.5 FM and 96.7 FM. And the topic today is, well, trade-offs in energy policy as Hawaii plans to switch to 100% green energy, and that's by the year 2045, all right? Is the goal feasible? That's a huge question. What are the costs and what are its benefits? So to explain all that in as great as a great of detail as possible, it will be Joe Kent, Executive Vice President at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. He's here to discuss these questions. Good Sunday morning to you, Joe. Good morning to you too, Johnny. Thanks for having me on your show. Once again, looking forward to all that great information that uh, you usually bring forward here. A bit of a background. Can you give me a bit of a background on the state's renewable energy goals at this time? Yeah, sure. So the state of Hawaii, the, uh, the legislature and the governor has, have enacted uh, requirements that Hawaii move to 100% renewable energy by the year 2045. And, um, you know, that includes switching our coal plants off and our oil generation, our fossil fuel plants off and, you know, ramping up solar and wind and geothermal and all other forms of renewable. And, um, you know, this has all come on a slate of different regulations. That's not the only one. There's others. You know, we're going to have all electric vehicles in the um, in the state's fleet and so on, light-duty vehicles and things. Um, and so this is a huge uh, goal and a huge undertaking. And I'm just uh, trying to calculate what the costs will be, which apparently are hard to find. Mm, okay, so in your opinion, what is the rationale behind them, these energy goals? Well, the rationale is that it could save money. I mean, if you look at Act 97, which is the, the 100% renewable goal, um, it says that it's switching to save money. It says that Hawaii's dependency on imported fuel drains the state's economy of billions of dollars each year, and switching... Uh, to renewables would um, help strengthen our economy. And other acts along those lines have said that, it, you know, we're going to save on costs by switching away from fuel. But uh, I'm not sure if that's the case. I mean, first of all, it's hard to predict the cost of anything in the future, uh, let alone oil and renewable energies. Exactly. Yeah. So where does the state get its electricity from right now? Well, right now, about... 68% of the state's energy makeup is from fossil fuels. That's mostly oil. Uh, 20% from solar, 6% from wind, 2% from geothermal, and 4% from hydro. So um, the vast majority right now of our electricity generation is from fossil fuels. But, you know, in Hawaiian Electric's new plan, um, they are proposing ramping down fossil fuels to only 30%, down from 68%, and ramping up solar to 68%. So um, that's a huge ramp up in solar energy. Um, interesting that they're not really taking on wind um, as part of that mix. Um, wind power only ramps up by a fraction or two, but... Um, but solar is apparently where it's at. I think wind has kind of fallen into disfavor by <laughs> environmental activists. I mean, you know, they tried to do a wind project up in Kahuku on Oahu and a few years ago, and it was environmental activists who protested against that, and and that's the comments that Hiko's getting is um, is apparently wind is not very popular. So solar, I guess, is going to be the path forward. What about the offshore wind projects? Have those also kind of uh, died away? I haven't heard much talk yes. about them. Yes, the, the offshore wind projects are 
also falling into disfavor and make up a very small fraction of the um, HECO's plan. In fact, in some instances of HECO's plan, there is no offshore wind um, by 2030. And so um, so that, that means solar is the focus. But, you know, solar isn't so environmentally friendly either. I mean, if you look at how much land is required for solar, it's hard to build houses on Oahu, let alone solar farms. And, you know, we can't even get our actual farms to work. And so, um, you know, this whole energy, renewable energy question is being exported onto our land. And, uh, and so it's really a question of how much land do we want to use for renewable energy. And another thing, just to stay on that topic, um, is how about the recycling of the older product, the, the blades from the windmills mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the solar panels? Have they thought about that? That's right. Uh, recycling is a huge environmental undertaking. You know, you have to dig into the ground to, to um, you know, and then you have to transport these blades mm-hmm. um, and, the, and the solar panels um, trying to... Um, dispose of those over many years can be an undertaking, not to mention also digging up the minerals required to produce those things. So renewable energy sometimes looks really clean when you see it, but what you're not seeing is all of the um, you know environmental effects of this behind the scenes. Hawaii plans to switch to 100% green energy by the year 2045. Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, is here to discuss some questions, and he'll provide some knowledge and some answers to the questions. Um, how much could the renewable energy mandate cost, in your opinion, and will electricity rates increase to pay for it? Well, Hawaii has the most expensive energy bills in the nation right now. And, of course, we also have the highest cost of living, you know, people are leaving the state because of this, and um, I'm worried that the switch to 100% renewables could spell even higher costs for residents. You know, it's funny that the the bills that require this all talk about saving money, and if you look at the um, HECO's projection, this is Hawaiian Electric Company put out a thousand-page study. I know, right? A thousand pages. Mm-hmm. It's a lot to read, and <laughs> But buried in that study, it shows that if we switch to 100% renewable energy, it will save about triple the cost than if we stay the same. So we'll see triple the savings on our electric bills. But, um, but actually, there's a footnote on that figure, because if you really look, dig into how they got to that, they are assuming that oil prices will triple in the future. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, if oil prices triple in the future, then your electric bill could triple. You know, that's true. But uh, that's a big if, though, because what if renewable prices go up in the future? Um, you know, we are seeing across the world that governments, uh, nations are putting in their own renewable energy goals, sometimes 100% renewable energy. So we've never had a moment in history where so many governments and so many people around the world are shifting away towards renewable energy, and that's going to increase the demand. And of course, economics goes, if the demand goes up, you know, the supply stays the same, the price goes up. And so we might actually, it's very feasible in the future to see oil prices going down and renewable prices going up. And if that happens, then it's the, you know, our electric bills are going up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And aren't wind and solar, though, right now and other renewables cheaper than oil? Yes, yes. uh, Wind and solar uh, can be very cheaper in in, uh, certain instances, but um, that's if you just look at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the picture. Remember that wind and solar are not reliable. They're intermittent. You know, we have to wait for the wind to blow or the sun to shine, and then we can use them. And in those instances, when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, uh, yes, they're cheaper. But if you look at the total cost um, of the 
you know, the, in, including the reliability of it, then oil is a huge cost savings. And so, uh, you know, you need batteries to store all of these, um, you know, uh, intermittent renewable energies. And the batteries have a huge cost to them. Now, you just um, kind of answered the uh, the next question. You know, if the plan relies so much on wind and solar, how will the islands deal with those, uh, you know, series of cloudy or windless days? I mean, we just heard about the um, the public school system. The DOE spent that money, and they said, yeah, we only have about four and a half, po- four and a half hours of, uh, of usage, you know, of, of sunlight for these classrooms or whatever it was. But uh, it wasn't reliable. It wasn't always there, so to speak. So will the grid still be reliable as uh, we just yeah. closed the last coal burning plant, do you think that that might have been premature? Yeah. So that reliability question is key. I mean, the the schools, as you know, had their own goal of uh, putting air conditioning in all the classrooms, mm-hmm. right? You remember that? that we um, and uh, people, the kids were, um, you know subject to very hot and humid classrooms. They couldn't even focus on their work. And it was a really big issue during the Ike administration era. And and so he had this goal of putting ACs in all the classrooms. The problem is we also had this goal of renewable energy. And so when they were trying to put the um, air conditioning in, um, they uh, many of the air conditioning systems were coupled with renewable air conditioning systems, um, you know, trying to update their grids to allow for a renewable uh, system. And that increased the cost, sometimes double or triple what a regular AC would have cost. And so, um, so that was, you know, that made the cost increase, of course, already. But, you know, if you look at what it takes to build a battery that can take in all of this wind and solar, um, the Kapolei battery station on Oahu um, cost about $500 million. And, okay, that's um, impressive, but it can only power the island for less than an hour. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, power, enough battery power to last for probably less than 40 minutes. And it was half a billion dollars. So at that rate, we'd need billions, maybe $10 billion just for the battery storage storage in case there were two cloudy days over the island. Wow. You know, so these systems are not reliable. Even proponents of the systems acknowledge that this is their Achilles heel. So what they've done to try to counteract that is to um, find different types of energy source storage systems. Like on Kauai, for example, they have a um, they actually pump water up to this sort of reservoir on the mountain, and then it goes down and and spins a turbine, and that's um, a natural battery, if you will. You know, they're pumping water and using that as the battery. Um, that's a really creative solution, and it works really well on Kauai, but that's because Kauai has a very small population mm-hmm. and a relatively large amount of land. On Oahu, it's the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a huge population and not much land. We are land constrained, so those types of creative solutions uh, will not work here. So, um, so yes, the battery question is the is the key question for renewables. Mm. And then you have Joe uh, Joe Kent joining us from the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, the Vice President of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Uh, on the on the uh, Big Island, Hawaii Island, you have the biodiesel or geothermal. Mm-hmm. What about those two options? I think biodiesel is burning wood, and then geothermal mm-hmm. from um, the uh, availability of the uh, volcano, the energy from that. Are there any renewables that could provide twenty four seven power? Oh yes, so biofuels are interesting. That that is um, also following falling out of political favorability. Uh, these are things like burning trees or plants mm-hmm. or wood pellets or power, and it could be a promising alternative. I mean, for renewable proponents, um, this is their solution to the firm power that's needed to counteract the um, intermittent power. So biodiesel, you can burn at night. You know, that's great. 
the problem is you're burning trees. <laughs> and it kind of, um, you know, is ironic for people who are trying to, you know, help the environment that we now need all these trees to burn in order to uh, accomplish this. Um, and plus, you know, biodiesel is kind of an inefficient way of reproducing what we already have, which is oil. But it, it, the cost to produce biodiesel is twice the price of gasoline. So, um, so it has a huge cost with it. Now, geothermal, on the other hand, is very promising. Um, there is a geothermal plant on the Big Island. I think it provides about 30% of that island's power. And uh, I actually went and toured the geothermal plant there. Very interesting um, that there, you know, we have this natural source of energy in Hawaii, which is the volcano. Mm -hmm. And it's a very old technology. I think it was like the 70s or 80s that they installed it. It's still working very, very efficiently. Um, and so that would definitely be a uh, an option, but not for the whole state. I mean, you can't get renewable. You can't get geothermal on Oahu. Um, you might be able to get it on Maui, but uh, but yeah, it's not the um, you know it's it's not the silver bullet. Okay, uh, so not no twenty four seven power right now with either of those two. Uh, what are the challenges? that other states are facing and countries encountering with their renewable energy mandates. I, I hear of some countries, I think Germany might have been one of maybe one of the Scandinavian countries, they re reverted, they brought back what they shut down, not in a full scale, but just to mm -hmm. assist with the burden that was put on these renewables when they uh, went to the, uh, the clean energy. Yeah, that's right. So Sweden actually has a 100% renewable goal that they have now abandoned. You know, the, the Swedish officials mm -hmm. abandoned this because um, it's just not feasible. Um, they said, we need more energy production. We need clean electricity, and we need a stable energy system, uh, according to their uh, finance minister. And But they couldn't reach that with the 100% renewable. And I think it was because of this firm power question. What are you going to do when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? You know, we still need power somehow. And so it just was unrealistic for them to reach that. And I think that is a similar thing that's going to happen with all of these states and nation states is to um, come to the realization that it actually might, the, the, the solution to the renewable energy problem might be worse than the problem itself <laughs> in mm. some cases. You know, if we can um, accept that in order to save costs, you know, uh, we may need to back away from the renewable energy goal, that might help save on, you know, the cost of living. But otherwise, we might see more people leaving the state as their energy bills jack up. You know, like I said, we're already the most expensive, um, sometimes double the cost on the mainland for our energy bills, but is that going to be triple, quadruple? You know, at some point, it's just too expensive. Um, and so uh, that's basically what I'm really interested in in this question about renewable energy is what's the cost? Because it's one thing to say, you know, laudatory um, and well meaning, um, uh, put, put well meaning goals out there. But it's another thing to pay for it. Remind me, Joe, was it Governor Linda Lingle who put this uh, this goal forward, the 2045 goal, or is that the uh, uh, following governor? Oh, that that was the uh, following governor. I believe that happened during the EGA administration in 2015. But, e um, oh. but the first goal was um, earlier than that, was in 2009. So that may, may very well have been in the Lingle administration. Okay. That goal tried to get to 40 percent but now we're at 100 percent. okay okay yeah, 100 percent by 2040 now back to um the geothermal bow diesel uh, are there is there any discussion about because they're bringing in smaller modules going nuclear in, in certain aspects or is that still you know way off limits because just of the perception yeah you know it, it's funny when it comes to any discussion about renewable energy nuclear always comes up and the um, 
it, there must be some sort of equation in renewable energy that the more feasible something is, the less politically popular it is. <laughs> and so, but the problem is that you need politic you need it to be both politically popular and feasible. Mm-hmm. And so with the nuclear option, um, it could be feasible. It, it might not be, but it's even difficult to talk about um, at all because of the political popularity of that. It's very, very unpopular. Okay. And finally, do you see any environmental downsides to renewables? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, you know, the mining that's involved in trying to um, dig up the raw and rare earth minerals that are needed to create these. I mean, just think about um, Teslas. You know, um, part of the renewable energy goal is to reach 100% renewable um, for automobiles, right? And so, does that mean that our gas cars, we have to, what, get rid of them by 2045? And what, buy Teslas? And, and, you know, how much does it cost in terms of environmental damage to make a Tesla or any other electric car? Because it's basically a giant moving battery, um, a lithium battery. And lithium is abundant, but it's becoming very scarce quickly. I mean, look at all the car companies across the world are now, uh, many of them are competing to build their own lithium mines in third world countries around the world just so they can secure the lithium. And if we've got the cars getting the lithium and the um, you know Hawaiian Electric and other utilities trying to get lithium for their battery storage, suddenly we've got you know, a gold rush, we've got a battery rush (laughs) for lithium. And it's not really, um, you know, environmentally friendly to do all that digging. So, like I said, sometimes you might actually, I'm wondering if we will actually cause more environmental damage in trying to save the environment. And then the weight of the batteries, because you're hearing studies coming out in England about what the damage it's doing compared to similar size vehicles of the uh, internal combustion engine cars, what it's doing to the roads. And that oh, that's true. These are like, uh, you know, t- it's like driving a tank, one of these. Have you ever driven a Tesla? It's, <laughs> it's really heavy. <laughs> but what's more concerning to me is the whole um, switch to a new scenario, a new world, a new um, energy and transportation system without much critical thought behind it, you know. So I'm asking questions to basically try to poke the bubble and to get other people to think about this um, because if we're if this is the new way forward, then um, we need to assess the risks um, diligently. Do you believe that they're willing to listen when you bring these issues up or has it been very difficult to you? for you to get no, I, any questions in and then people answer them, you know, and you can have a back and I forth find, to dialogue. Yeah, I find that renewable proponents are extremely um, uh, good at listening and and receptive and want to talk about these issues because um, the timeline has now um, scooted up to where they are also asking these questions. You know, talk to any renewable uh, proponent or enthusiast or company, and they are well aware of that these are the Achilles heel issues for renewable generation okay. 24-7, 100%. So, okay. um, so they want to be part of the conversation, too. I'm just kind of driving it forward. All right. Uh, Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Where can they find your work and the rest of your team's work? Yes, our uh, work is at grassrootinstitute.org, and we have an email list of 40,000 people who, you know, get our stuff every week about the cost of living, the cost of electricity, the cost of health care and groceries and taxes and so on. So if you'd like to get onto that, you can go to grassrootinstitute.org. Joe, thanks for taking the time on this Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks so much, Johnny. Enjoy your day, too. The views and opinions.